and John was working for a uh, retail chain, and he also studied fine art. So, no, we didn't really have any skills in this field, um, but I guess it worked. <laughs> What's up everyone, welcome back to Moonlight Game Devs. Today I had a chat with Michael Brown, who is one of the three co-founders of Boneloaf, the company that is responsible for the massive indie game hit, Gang Beasts. Hey Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. You're one of the co-founders of Boneloaf, the company behind Gang Beasts. Can you tell me a little bit about you know, your background and how you got into the games industry? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I mean... Since uh, I was a kid, I always wanted to make video games. It was either that of an architect. Uh, I didn't have the maths for architecture. But um, I guess kind of fell into the games industry backwards a bit. Uh, I kind of failed at university uh, a little bit. Um, I had to take a year out, so we set up a company with my, my two brothers. And um, we was working on a bunch of prototypes. And then... Um, we went to a, a small sort of uh, developer meetup with a prototype of the game, and uh, people seemed to like it. So we just decided to upload it, and then um, yeah, within about an hour or so of uploading it, it was played on the live stream to a Giant Bomb. Wow! And we've been playing catch up ever since. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, yeah. Well, that's incredible that you got that success so quickly. How long did it take you guys? Um, I don't know if you mentioned it, but how long did? You take you to kind of create that prototype and how did you guys kind of approach that did you guys have different versions of games you tried and uh yeah so basically it was kind of a uh, just hacking away until it worked um uh, because none of us are uh, trained programmers um mm -hmm. also we didn't have an animator so we figured if we do it with physics uh, maybe we can get smooth animations and things and it seems to have worked we Literally started with a cube to see if we could move it around with physics. And then um, we was actually trying to make uh, a couple of different games. Like We did a bunch of game jumps at the time. Mm -hmm. um, one of them was a high fantasy kind of uh, game uh, with physics. And then um, the other one was a space opera, once again with physics. These are all just physics character system systems. Mm -hmm. And then eventually... Uh, these were all just kind of out of scope for our skill set. And um, we just figured if you can punch someone in the face, you've got a game. <laughs> so we kind of tried to make um, Final Fight, Streets of Rage, them kind of side scrolling beat em ups. Mm -hmm. And though there's been a lot of limitations because we've been learning on the job. Um, so part of it is the reason this for the color is because it was easier to do color instead of having UI for names and things. I mean, the reason they have short legs is uh, there's an invisible ball between the legs that helps them move. And uh, oh. yeah, the kind of abstracted look of them is just because I was trying to keep it simple, focus on the gameplay first. And then people seem to like it, uh, so we couldn't change it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we started making Streets of Rage kind of clone, but... Um, didn't have the ability to make good AI at the time. So we uh, figured put in multiple players and see how it plays and things. And it kind of just evolved into what Gang Beast is today. Right. So how, how long did you guys take, you know, on making, because you mentioned you made, made several different types of games. How long did you give a game until you were like, ah, is this not really going in the direction or is this kind of out of scope? How did you guys kind of determine that and how long did it take you? I guess it was was about a year in total, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but it's kind of muddy because it was all in the same project. It was all kind of the same thing. Yeah. Because we were using the same character system for them all. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's kind of muddy. Oh, thank you for taking us through that early stage there. So you kind of started refining on your idea, and then you felt like you were ready to kind of present it at that meetup. And eventually, you know, it did get picked up by by a big content creator. Um, tell us a little bit about, you know, what happened there when you guys realized it's going viral and, and you know, you were really onto something. What was the first thing you guys kind of thought, what went for your head and, you know, how we, did you guys react to that? I uh, didn't believe it, really. Uh, <laughs> it was kind of shaky. Uh, 
Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's all been kind of uh, bizarre, like the whole life of the game. I mean, basically, it was Giant Bomb that played it. And then uh, I think it was a week later, uh, Nerd Cubed, the YouTuber, uh, picked it up as well and was on green light thinking, all right, this will take maybe a year or two for us to get popular enough to go through the green light system. Mm. And then um, he said, green light this game. And uh, we did. I think we were through in about a week or two. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> like, how did you guys start with um, with kind of improving the game? Because I'm assuming, you know, it didn't have quite the amount of content that, you know, it eventually had at launch. Um, you mentioned that you were on green light, but... How did you guys kind of go about iterating over the initial success and, and building upon that? Um, basically, just all sitting around the computer and trying to see what worked. Uh, like a prime example is uh, I don't know if you've played the game. Uh, there's a yeah. gondola stage uh, and that came about from a idea: is can you swing on a rope? And we got a rope. Well, we made a rope. Uh, it grabbed on, kind of swung, and mm-hmm. that kind of worked. And then we figured, what if it, we made it into a swing? So we put a platform between two ropes and it didn't really work that well, but you could stand on it. So we figured stick a bigger platform, put ropes on all sides and it just kind of evolved from there. So a lot of the uh, early stuff that we did was just iterating and playing. Yeah. Um, same goes for trucks. Uh, the fan stage was because uh, fans wanted zero gravity we fin- didn't feel like it fitted thematically. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we wanted a way of actually, oh, what if it's just a giant fan that blows up in the air and kind of does that. Right. How did you kind of go about, you know, deciding and dealing with that player feedback? Um, kind of, you know, deciding what, what kind of input from the players is going to fit into the game or what are you going to implement? And how do you kind of keep that balance between making the customers happy and, and doing kind of your own vision for the game? Um, well, usually uh, we've already had the idea. Uh, we don't have a problem with ideas. Uh, I think we have a problem with too many ideas. <laughs> um, so like, there's things like uh, blood. We had, uh, because we was trying to prototype a high fantasy game, we looked at blood initially. Yeah. We ended up scrapping it because both there was a bug with it that uh, made it very uh, expensive performance-wise. It just kept spraying everywhere. Um and just it just didn't seem thematically appropriate once again. Um, but yeah, it's I guess other things. It's a uh, balance. It's um, we'll try things and see if it works, uh, or try and adjust things to see if it works. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. But yeah, generally it's just trying <laughs> and seeing. Yeah, awesome. Was there also like maybe like an age concern? You know, did you guys have kind of an idea of the demographic that was playing the game as well and considered that? Um, initially, no, we, uh, kind of just built the game for ourselves, uh, like just to see, because we grew up playing games together, uh, like Mario Kart and things like that. Mm. Um, so yeah, we just built the game for ourselves and luckily people seem to like it, but now we do have a pretty wide uh, range of people playing the game. So we do try to make sure that it is appropriate for uh younger audiences as well as older Mm. and just like the whole beauty of it like when we take it to events uh the fact that it can bring complete strangers together and they all enjoy it they all laugh like yeah we've had emails from uh, families saying about their parents are playing with their kids and the parents don't play video games yeah it's that kind of thing that is just it makes it all worthwhile yeah, I remember a friend showing with me, uh, showing me the game, and yeah, I had the kind of feeling that you know one of the big appeals I think is that it is kind of like the controls are like easy to understand, they're minimal, but then there is like a pretty deep layer in the kind of casual play of it as well, because you can get re- like there's like a skill that you can learn in, in the game and, and get pretty good at it. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you're already pretty good. <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've spent a lot of hours playing this game. But um, yeah, we found that in like, uh, I like the game Dota uh, and like, you know how they do tournaments and that. Yeah. We appeared in like uh, the Dota house, the at one of the uh, internationals. And so it's like, what on earth is going on? But it seems to be pretty popular with uh, 
pro players of other games like uh, we've shown at, um evo a few times mm-hmm. which is like completely bizarre because you have these really refined uh frame perfect uh fighting <laughs> games like uh yeah. street fire and then you have gang beasts where you can lose to someone who's not even playing <laughs> yeah that's kind of yeah that's pretty that's really interesting for sure have you guys thought about kind of making events as well? Do you guys host like community events or anything like that? Um, yeah, we've uh, we have a uh, it goes up to thirty players, but we've only shown it twenty players. Uh, Royal Rumble kind of thing that we have taken to one or two events, and because the game shows so well at events, we've tried to make uh, more spectacle uh, versions of the game, like um, event specific. Mm-hmm. Uh, same goes for tournaments, like. Every time we've hosted a tournament, it's been amazing. Uh, like something just happens that just we didn't expect, and there's just an uproar of laughter. So yeah, events and uh, things like that are something that we really want. Yeah. Also, like um, just yeah, showing the game, like I say, uh, events, but the normal game has always been kind of a good thing. Um, like it's just. It's not just to show the game, it's also kind of to recharge our batteries, I guess. Uh, just because like, if you're just working at it every day, it's kind of hard. Sometimes you kind of get stuck in it, stuck in a rut. Yeah. And then you'll see people uh, laughing and things when they're at an event, and it just yeah makes it worthwhile revitalizes you and kind of gives you the energy to pursue the game you've been working on. And yeah, like you said, already played a lot, <laughs> uh, I guess, which makes perfect sense. I want to kind of take it back to when you guys started making the game a little bit and talk kind of about the implementation details there as well. Like uh, you mentioned that you, you didn't, you guys didn't know anything really about game development or you, you weren't like too technical about it. How about your, your uh, brothers there? Um, what about them? Did they have some expertise or something like that? Well, James, he uh, he was teaching um, physical computing, mm-hmm. uh, so his background is fine art. And John was working for a uh, retail chain, uh, and he also studied fine art. Right. So, no, we didn't really have any skills in this field. Um, I guess, luckily for us, we just kind of, I guess we're stubborn. Yeah. I just kept trying until it worked. <laughs> I mean, the amount of time of, we've sunk into just trying to tweak the character system to get right early on was insane. But I guess it worked <laughs> in the end. Yeah, Obvi- obviously it did, right? Mm. Um, game did really well. So how did you guys get get started with that learning process? Like, what technologies did you do and use at the beginning, and how did you get like how did you come up with them? Um, you. Unity is the game engine we use. Uh, I don't think we could have done it without it. Um, it just meant that we could rapidly iterate. And I think that's helped so much for the learning process. Mm. Yeah, it's just looking at the documentation and things, uh, just trying, like seeing, oh, what does this do? Poke about with the code and see and see if it works. Um, yeah, it was just throwing physics six things and just seeing if it works. Uh, there's definitely some things that we did wrong. Well, there's a lot of things we did wrong. Um, and we actually uh, had to rebuild the game uh, a few times just to get around them. Like The first time was because we wrote the entire game in JavaScript. Um, oh, you was, mean like Unity's built-in language? Yeah. The, the one that no one uh, uses? Yeah. The, <laughs> and uh, we found that uh, there was better ways to do it. So we eventually learned how to do that and did it in that. And then um, Unity updated the physics uh, from, it was a pretty substantial update from the uh, physics uh, engine. I can't remember what the numbers difference was, but it was, it was big. Uh, I think this was around Unity 4 to 5. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, and yeah, uh, That's a while back. We had to um, rebuild the entire character system because the physics changed so substantially mm-hmm. but it was uh we had to do it just because the performance gain was substantial and then when we went on steam there was another one that we had to do just to fix some of the legacy issues that came about from learning uh to actually yeah. do this and we might even have to do it one more time to get the full performance of everything 
and fix some of the other legacy issues that have come up. But it's all getting there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's uh, kind of the process of game development for most, just kind of <laughs> breaking and making things and then you know learning as you go. I want to talk a little bit about um, kind of that process of like, you mentioned that you started off just kind of piecing together the, the actual player characters and uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about like how, how what are the, the things that are going on there with the character because it has like quite a unique kind of movement there and like you mentioned the character is kind of standing on a ball mm -hmm. um, are there any other aspects to it like in the implementation that you might want to share that were maybe quite interesting as a result of that kind of approach there sure yeah um so basically like i say uh, we threw physics at it uh, so they are fully they're basically walking ragdolls mm. uh, we actually did do a few different uh ways of doing it early on like we tried using uh, motors on the joints and um, using uh, ray casts to uh, support the body so they didn't need the ball but we found there was always a kind of compromise to the way the character moved or the just the whole feel of it. Mm -hmm. So we ended up uh, kind of going with this way and it let us um, have the right kind of velocity when jumping and landing. Also solved a, a problem that we was having with when the feet leave the ground, the ball kind of kept rolling. Uh, but uh, yeah, overall, I think it's just yeah it's just physics uh, we pull on one end and pull on the other and it kind of aligns and things like that yeah it's all very i guess dumb when you look at it the way we did it but i think it kind of gives it kind of the floppiness the kind of it's not so rigid it's kind of fluid yeah i know what you mean exactly that's what i kind of felt when i played it as well there's kind of a feeling of you know yeah, I don't know how to explain it. Like wonkiness, I guess, is how I would explain it. The character just kind of wobbles around and, and you, sometimes you feel like you're not completely in control of yeah. what's going on. But yeah, that definitely adds to the to fun and like the streamability of it as well. Yeah, yeah. Is there anything like, have you guys uh, kind of been communicating with some of the influencers or is that just something that kind of, you know, evolved by itself and, and the game just kind of spread by itself in that community? Um, yeah, it's been mostly just them picking it up. Uh, once or twice, uh, people have uh, emailed us to request codes and things, but generally it's just them seeing the game, liking the game, and playing the game, which has been amazing because like, it's always surprising. Like I've, I've watched YouTube. I think everybody probably watches YouTube. Uh, <laughs> but like, there would be a channel I'm watching that you like, and they're, suddenly they're playing the game. Uh, like, wow. Like Sinan, uh, when I saw him play the game, it was uh, amazing. I can only imagine what it must be like to suddenly just, you know, see your favorite YouTuber. Just He just opens your game. It's like... What? Yeah, yeah. It's bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> That's, yeah, but huge congrats on that for sure. How did you guys kind of, you know, get started when you, you guys were, um, you know, learning Unity? Did you guys kind of decide that, you know, someone is going to do these certain skills? Uh, for example, maybe art or... Did you guys all kind of work on the same thing? Tell us a little bit about that division of work there. That um, you guys use. It's just kind of been a um, bit of everybody. Like just we've all kind of, I guess, luckily um, early on, it was just uh, like three brothers. Um, yeah. And we kind of already had an idea. We kind of, you know, we kind of understand each other. Uh, well, hopefully, <laughs> not always. Uh, it does make sense that we made a game about fighting, <laughs> um, but because we have a small team, like there's about I should know this actually. But there's about eight of us now, I think. Mm -hmm. It's always kind of had to be all hands on deck. Yeah, we're trying to professionalize a bit more now. Now things are stabilizing, but uh, yeah, I think it'll always be kind of um, a I don't want to say democratic process. I don't think that's the right words, but flat hierarchies. Yeah, it's it's a very flat hierarchy, and we all kind of chip in here and there. Makes perfect sense. Uh, so I want to know, like you just mentioned, that you grew the company already to you know eight people. How did you guys approach that hiring process? And like, is it still that everyone in the team is is wearing multiple hats, or is it you hired? Realized there was some specific need for a person with that skill set, and you know you hired them or. 
Um, well, it's been a bit of a weird hiring process um, because, like I say, we've been learning on the job, not just like the game development, but the company side. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so there's been a lot of hiring of friends and a lot of the work is kind of, we're kind of learning. <laughs> so mm. uh, only recently we've hired people who, uh, I guess, started off with the skills, which sounds bizarre. Um, though we did, uh, when we was going got to Steam, we did partner with a company called CoatSync mm -hmm. uh, to help with the online because we just didn't have the skills. Um, uh, our rating was getting uh, kind of hammered by people asking for online. Right, yeah. That makes sense. So like, we always wanted to add it, but we just didn't have the skills in-house. So we hired them, and they've been a big help for uh, a lot of this kind of, like, trying to tidy up some of the things we've made, <laughs> I guess. Is this like a consulting company or something like that that will be work for hire? Uh, no, no. Uh, I mean, it's a bit more than that. I mean, they have, well, the CEO and that, uh, friends of uh, us as well. All right. Uh, it's just they have their own company. They do a lot of, I mean, there's, there's quite a few games that they um, they work with mm -hmm. to make their own thing, uh, to, to help, sorry. Uh, so it's more like, um, I can't think of the correct term for it. There is a correct term, but I'm not good with words. So yeah, they basically, they're more, it's not consulting, it's they're working on the game. Right. Like contracting or work for hire kind of? Um, no, no, not even that. It's like, I guess mm. it's more like they are co-developers, I guess. Right. I think you explained it there. Like, I think I get what you mean for sure. <laughs> so I think you explained a lot there um, in terms of like how you guys went about everything. So that's awesome. I just have like a few, I guess, like hot seat questions. I don't know, mm -hmm. um, to, to kind of get... Uh, find out a little bit about, more about kind of yours as well. Uh, so, like, if you weren't working on Gang Beasts, what kind of game would you make? Um, Grim Beasts or okay. maybe Star Beasts. Uh, <laughs> I mean, they've always been the kind of ones that I want to get to, but we just, like I say, at the time we didn't have the skills to do it. And so, it, yeah, it'd be some sort of physics game. Um, just there's something about the physics that. I love yeah. that it just seems to work and brings joy to me, like personally. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'd probably be one of them. Kind of like, uh, to get that right, like a a game with like a more kind of like leveling up or meta or something like that. Uh, sure what guys were aiming for at the beginning or? Yeah, it's, it'd be more like, um, I guess, Golden Axe meets Shadow Colossus, I guess. <laughs> mm, I see. Okay, so another question is like, now that you guys have all that success um, and you guys growing the company right now, what like what is next for you guys? Um, you know, what are your plans? Are you going to continue working on Gang Beasts? Are you looking for like new ways to maybe monetize the game? I mean, at some point, you know, I guess you guys have to move on to a different projects, I guess, or no? Um, yeah, it's a bit of both. Um... Like we will be working on Gang Beasts for the foreseeable future, uh, like but near future anyway. Um, mm -hmm. Eventually, we want to get Gang Beasts into a place where we're happy with because there's been a lot of bugs. Like we've had to work quickly for like PlayStation and all that and other consoles uh, to just try and get it stable and running on them. But because there's been a lot of kind of patching and things, uh, there's been certain things that have crept in, like bad practices and things that we're fixing. Um, mm -hmm. So once we're happy with where the game is, uh, we can start looking at the next one. Right. Um, we probably will have to look at some sort of like a DLC just because uh, we host the servers ourselves. Well, we use a multiplayer. Right. And because of the physics and that, the game needs quite beefy servers. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's quite expensive. Um, but yeah, right now we don't charge, Not don't want to charge until things are a bit more stable and clean, I guess. Yeah. And we also, like towards the end of the life of the game, we want to make it so um, people can actually host their own servers. And that way, even if like we don't support servers anymore, people can still play the game online and that. 
with their own setups. Kind of like a, like StarCraft and things like that. You know, they still are played. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, and after that, we'll be taking uh, portions of this character system and that and refining them for the next game. You mentioned there, what was it called? Multiplay? Yeah. Is it kind of like a hosting, like server hosting, or is there like a, they offer some kind of tooling to make it easier to make the multiplayer game? I've never heard of that, so I'd be curious to know what it what made it a good choice. They're basically, it's a hosting service uh, that actually Unity recently bought. Um, oh, So okay. it kind of looked out for us. Uh, before that, we was using um, Amazon service, but mm-hmm. uh, it made more sense for the to use multiplayer for the servers just financially all right it was like a little bit cheaper or yeah it was it was just i think overall a better deal and uh just easier to work with i mean i don't know 100 percent myself uh, because it's more coaxing handling the online side yeah yeah i understand I, I i can see i will need to look at it myself a little bit i guess then it really seems like you guys had like a little bit of trouble just upgrading things and then working out the different bugs that occur from that. Like, have you guys learned anything from that? Like how to approach that process of upgrading the software that you're using? Um, well, usually we don't have that much problems. Uh, I think it's partly just um, in this version, uh, uh, certain things have been uh, depreciated. Like uh, the online net code has been depreciated, so it will go away. So we're having to swap that out. Right, uh, and just a few things like that uh, just kind of uh, have made it hard to kind of get a steadfast approach to updating. Mm-hmm. And also, I guess uh, last year was kind of a hard year. Um, we kind of all burnt out a little bit, so we kind of just tried to be a bit easier on ourselves while we recharge and get things actually working correctly instead of just constantly patching. But uh, yeah, we've actually um, brought Unity on board now. Um, oh, wow. Like we're yeah. working with Unity to fix legacy issues with the project, and that's been a massive help. Uh, hopefully, uh, we can start showing some of that stuff soon. Uh, that's incredible, yeah. Yeah, I, I can't wait. Some of the stuff is amazing. Has like Unity... Uh... If you don't mind, can you share with, with us like how, how that collaboration happened? Did you guys reach out to Unity? Was it you know vice versa? And what kind of services did they offer? Um, well, basically, there's a few different services that they offer, and um, yeah, we reached out to them. Um, but it might have been one of the people that reached out to us first, and then, but my memory's hazy. So yeah, basically, there's a bunch of services they have. Like uh, I think it's called ISS or something like that. Uh, um, and uh, yeah, it's kind of like a paid service and you can get access to their engineers and things. And it's, yeah, it's been so helpful. Awesome. Thanks for sharing so much uh, information already. Um, but I guess my last question is like, what are the things that you've kind of learned from um, this journey of just creating your own games company and, and growing the game? Yeah. Tell us there are some of the things you would like to know for other people trying to do the same thing. Yeah, uh, I didn't realize it was nearly as stressful as it is. I mean, there's been times where, uh, due to a bug, I've had to stay in the office for three days straight, just not sleeping. Uh, I I did sleep, but I slept in the office. Um, (laughs) Jeez, yeah. Also, don't make a physics game. It's horrible, (laughs) because any updates to the physics engine can break things, and it's so much tweaking. I mean, maybe competent programmers could figure out a better way but uh we've not <laughs> so there's always been a bit of tweaking um i don't know really what else uh, i guess there was actually uh, a quote from uh rami ishmael uh that always springs to mind which is uh, i can't remember the exact quote but it's like uh game development's kind of like a tree of a, a sapling sorry and uh you can kind of shape it and that but you can't tell it exactly which way to grow. It's just kind of kind of an organic thing. So I don't be too precious about design docs and things. Just see where it goes. Uh, at least that was my take from it anyway. Uh, I think that's great advice because, yeah, in the end, you know, you're making the game for other people and they decide, like, the direction of the, of the game once it gets traction to many degrees. Like, mm-hmm. 
yeah so uh, michael thanks so so much for for sharing all of that and uh, mm-hmm. good luck with the rest of the development thank you yeah, and uh, yeah, thank you for having me thanks for listening to the show i hope you enjoyed it to make sure you don't miss another episode hit that subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening to and leave a comment or review it really motivates me and helps me improve the show have a great week and be sure to tune in for next week's episode